Hello, welcome back again uh, for the opportunity. We were just so grateful for the opportunity that we could come together and uh, have a time of worship again uh, before we get into the Word of God. And uh, just want to say that we miss you guys um, so much, and we're just so excited. It just feels like uh, we'll be together real soon, and just just hang in there and. Um, Continue worshiping, continue watching, and um, praising the Lord in that intimate time at home uh, with your family. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you, God, for this time. Again, Lord, that you give us, that we could come, Father, together no matter where we're at, Lord. Father, because our hearts are knitted together, Lord, in, in one love, Father. We love you, God. So we thank you for this time, God, and we just ask, Lord, that you would show us amazing things through this time, Lord. Uh, We know that uh, this is no surprise to you, God, and Father, your hand is upon everything that happens, Lord. So we pray that out of all this, that some good would come, Lord. We pray for those families that, that, that lost people, Lord, and that have people that are sick right now, God. We lift them up to you, Lord. May they find comfort in you, Lord. May they see you. May you open, Father, the eyes, Father, of their heart, Lord, that they may see you, God, in this time. We love you, God. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. See you high and lifted up. Shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power in love as we sing holy, holy, holy. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to Open the eyes. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. See you high and lifted up. Shining in the light of your glory Pour out your power and love As we sing holy, holy, holy See you high and lifted up Shining in the light of your glory Pour out your power and love As we sing Holy, holy, holy Holy, holy, holy Holy, holy, holy Holy, holy, holy And I want to see you You are holy, holy I want to see you. Over the mountains and the sea, your river runs with love for me. And I will open up my heart and 
And let the healer set me free I'm happy to be in the truth And I will daily lift my hands For I will always sing That when your love came down I could sing of your love forever 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 Over the mountains and the sea Your river runs with love for me And I will open up my heart Let the healer set me free I'm happy to be in the truth And I will daily lift my hands For I will always sing When your love came down I could sing of your love forever And I could sing of your love forever And I could sing of your love forever I could sing of your love forever Oh, I feel like dancing This foolishness I know But when the world has seen the light They will dance with joy Like we're dancing now I could sing of your love I could sing of your love forever 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 Cause you are holy, holy, holy Holy, holy, holy Holy, holy, holy And I want to see you Let's do that one more time, holy Holy, holy Lord, we thank you so much, God, for this time that you've given us together. Lord, you are holy. And God, we could sing, Lord. We could sing all day, Lord, all night, forever, Lord. We could sing of your great love. We thank you for it, for your patience, your kindness, Lord, and just everything that you've bestowed upon your people. We love you, God. We thank you. Teach us, Lord, in your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, good evening, church family. It's great to be with you again today. And as we continue our studies in the book of Psalms, and we finished Psalm 119 last week. You know, we spent a lot of time there. It was a great psalm, and it was kind of like leaving an old friend and moving on. And tonight we're going to um, you know, pick up in Psalm 120, and tonight's title is A Prayer for Relief from Bitter Enemies. So let's open in a word of prayer. Father, Thank you so much for your uh, goodness. We thank you for your faithfulness to us, Lord, your love. We thank you for all the wonderful things that you are and the things that you do for us, God, and especially when we're so undeserving, God. We thank you that you don't uh, base it on, on whether I'm good or bad, God, but you're good and, and you, you give to me based upon your goodness, Lord. And I thank you, Father, Father for so much for that. And I thank you for your faithfulness, Lord, as you continue to provide for us here at, uh, at Cornerstone, God, your faithfulness and the, the faithfulness of your people, God. We just, uh, Lord, we thank you so much, and we look forward to the day when we can uh, sit together in the sanctuary, Lord, and, and, and praise you and worship you, Lord, as a body. And uh, we do have so much to praise you for, God, and 
to give thanks for. So, God, we pray now that your spirit would have full reign in this place and that, God, you would touch every heart that's watching tonight. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Psalm 120. The psalm starts out with the psalmist being in distress in verse 1. And then the psalm finishes in verse 7 with war. But in between the the first and the last verse, uh, it deals with deception and defamation or slander. This psalm seems to be, you know, it seems to be kind of out of place for a bunch of travelers to be singing as they're making their way to the sanctuary of God. But it seems that the psalmist was in the same situation as the psalmist was in in Psalm 42, where circumstances uh, stopped him from attending the feast. He had to stay home with people who made uh, life difficult for him. We read in Psalm 42, verse 3, and then 9 and 10, he says, My tears have been my food day and night. Well, they continually say to me, where is your God? That's Psalm 42, 3. And then verses 9 and 10, the psalmist says, I will say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As with a breaking of my bones, my enemies approach, reproach me while they say to me all day long, where is your God? The singing of this psalm would remind the pilgrims that they were truly privileged to be able to go to Jerusalem and that others would have liked to go with them. And it also reminded the travelers or the pilgrims that when they got back home, they needed to share some of the blessings that they received with those who stayed home and to, make, and to help make life easier for them. The psalm reminds believers today that worship is a privilege as we have all experienced in the last couple of months, just being here worshiping together. Um, We need to share the blessings that God gives us. When we find ourselves, you know, dealing with distress and disappointment, we we have responsibilities to carry out if our burdens are to become blessings. Psalm 120 starts a new series in the book of Psalms. Psalms 120 through 134 are called a song of ascents or, or, or degrees in our Bibles. That's why I said it, it seems out of place for a, a bunch of believers to be singing this song as they march to the sanctuary of God. Or they can be called pilgrim psalms. A Hebrew scholar has translated uh, a song of ascents as songs of the pilgrim caravans or uh, on the homeward marches. The common opinion is that these psalms were either sung by pilgrims on the ascending march from Babylonian captivity to Jerusalem. And it's an ascending march. And every time you see, it's mentioned when they're going to Jerusalem, it's going up. They're going up to Jerusalem. And so again, uh, these songs were sung by pilgrims uh, ascending from uh, Babylon. They were going up from Babylon uh, from their captivity to Jerusalem. Or they were sung by worshipers from all parts of Palestine as they traveled, that is, ascended to the temple for the yearly feast. Now, each, each psalm is a step along the journey. It kind of you know, describes the journey. Psalm 120 here starts the journey in a faraway land in hostile surroundings. Psalm 122 pictures the pilgrims arriving in Jerusalem, and the rest of the psalms are moving toward the temple, mentioning different characteristics of God along the way. So let's begin now in Psalm 120 with verses 1 through 4. And the psalmist says, In my distress I cried to the Lord, and he heard me. Deliver my soul, O Lord, from lying lips and from a deceitful tongue. What shall be given to you, or what shall be done to you, you false tongue? Sharp arrows of the warrior with coals, of the broom tree. So the psalmist saying that he took his troubles to the Lord and that he <clears throat> cried out to him and God answered his prayer. He prayed, rescue me, Lord, from liars and from all deceitful people. He said from the deceitful tongue, he says, and he says about the deceitful tongue, what will God do to you? How will he increase your punishment? You'll be pierced with arrows and burned with growing coals. Again, talking about those lying tongues. 
Here the psalmist is asking the Lord to deliver him from a false tongue, from those who are lying about him. And the psalmist tells us about his own experience in this. His prayer reminds us of the kind of world that we live in. Man, we live in a world of corruption, you know, and and, and, um, corrupt people. We live in a world with liars and lies. So the starting place for our spiritual journey here is to see the world for what it really is so that we can turn away from it. The scripture tells us many things about the world that we live in. Uh, John tells us, uh, Jesus tells us in John 16, 33, that the world is a place of tribulation. Jesus said, in the world you will have tribulation. Uh, 1 John 2, 17, John tells us this world is a temporary place. He says, the world is passing away. It's temporal. In 1 John 3, 13, uh, we're told that the world is not a place uh, where we're loved. John says, the world hates you. Satan is the God of this world. 2 Corinthians 4, 4, whose minds the God of this age or this God of this world has blinded. So we see a lot of negative things mentioned in scripture about this world. We read that this world is not our home, that we are pilgrims here. Hebrews eleven thirteen. they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. A pilgrim is a person who has grown dissatisfied, is no longer happy with where they he or she has been and and they're on their way to something better philippians 1 23 says to be with christ is far better we read in hebrews 7 19 there is a there there is the bringing of a better hope we read in hebrews 11 16 but now they desire a better heavenly country for he has prepared a city for them we read in Hebrews eleven thirty eight, God having provided something better for us. Again, this world is a negative place. It's a, it's a bad place for us. And, and God is preparing something better for us. That's why we're, we're not to make this place our home. We're not to hold on to this world. We're not to, you know, to, to take stock in it. A Christian pilgrim is one who has repented of the lies that are all around him and the lies that are in him. And who's now going to God. And and he's going to get there through the only way that we can. And that is through Jesus Christ. Now, we all have to be honest. Many of these lies have some truth to them. Or we wouldn't believe them. We wouldn't fall for them. Satan, Jesus said that Satan is the father of lies. Satan loves to mix lies with half-truths. But remember, a half-truth is a whole lie. Now, some of these half-truths, you know, may have the right facts, but they're still lies just the same because, you see, they leave out God. They don't tell us that we come from God. These, These right facts may not tell us that we come from God and that we have our destiny in God. And that we're here to know and to serve God. They also tell us about the world, okay? The, 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 these right facts that Satan will use tells us about the world, but he doesn't tell us that God made the world and that God created us and everything else in it. In Revelation 4.11, John said, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. We were created for his good pleasure. But Satan doesn't tell us that. Satan tells us about our bodies, but he doesn't tell us that they belong to God. He doesn't tell us that they are temples of the Holy Spirit. Satan's little bits of truth that he throws in tell us to love, but he doesn't tell us about the source of love. And that God who loves us and gave himself for us, and that God is love and that he first loved us. Satan doesn't tell us those things. The world lies to us every single day. It tells us that people are basically good. They're nice. And that everybody's born equal and everybody's innocent and and self-sufficient and that we're born free. And And that if we're in chains now, if we're in bondage in some way, it's somebody else's fault. But we can fix ourselves. 
We just need a little more money, a little more education, a little more work, or a little more time. And when people find out what the world is really like, a lot of people get angry and get upset rather than recognize the lie and turn from the lie and to turn to God, to turn to, turn to God in His truth. If we want to be Christians, we need to ask God to save us, to deliver us from these lies, like the psalmist is doing in verse 2. Again, the psalmist was in distress in verse 1. Why? Because of lying lips and a deceitful tongue. You see, there were people who were out to ruin him. And because of their lies, they almost did. How did they almost ruin him? By lying to him. They flattered him. They said nice things to him. They were like friends to him. And, and, and they made promises of kindness. And, and, and they promised to, a service to him. So that they might be more confident. When they, when they told the psalmist all of this, it helped them to be more confident in their plan without creating suspicion in the psalmist's mind so that they could carry out their plans against them, against him. That is, you know, they smiled in his face. They patted him on the back. And you see, that's what did him in. The most dangerous enemies and, and those that are the hardest to recognize and to protect yourself from are those who, who carry on their wicked plans under the disguise of being your friends. Watch out for flatterers who are always pumping, your, pumping you up and, you know, and, and just flattering you. Proverbs 29.5 says, A man who flatters his neighbor spreads a net for his feet. It's a trap. And remember, flattery is not communication. It is manipulation. Now, the reason that we fall for it so much is, who doesn't like to be flattered? We like to be flattered. We all want to be liked. We all want to be talked well about. We're all so vulnerable to flattery. And that's why the scriptures warns us. But flattery can be a dangerous trap. And we're warned not to fall into it. Proverbs 20, 19 says, Therefore do not associate, notice, with one who flatters with his lips. Secondly, the way the psalmist was also ruined by these folks who, who disguised themselves to be friends, he says they, they told lies about him. They made false accusations about the psalmist and they blamed him for things that he didn't know anything about or, or, the, or things that he did. And you know what? This happens a lot to people. It happens a, a lot to good people. People who have been, who have, who, who've been caused a lot of suffering by liars and, and, and haven't only had their, their names, you know, tarnished and hated because of slander and because of lies, but their lives and everything that's important to them you know, in their life, you know, has been put in danger because of false witness. The psalmist here was a type of Christ because he was distressed by lying lips and deceitful tongues just like Jesus Christ was. And in the psalmist's distress, he had a way, a way out through God by faithful and fervent prayer. He said in verse 1, notice, I cried to the Lord. David did the same thing when he was accused of things he didn't do and slandered. In Psalm 109, verses 1 through 4, David said, Do not keep silent, O God of my praise, for the mouth of the wicked and the mouth of the deceitful have opened against me. They have spoken against me with a lying tongue. They have also surrounded me with words of hatred and fought against me without a cause. But this is what he does. He says, In return for my love, they are my accusers, but I give myself to prayer. This is the best and safest way to deal with people who lie about you. <clears throat> Many times we want to defend ourselves and we want to say, that's not true. This is really the truth. This is really what happened. And, 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 you, know that, and, and you know what? Many times we end up, I think, causing more damage trying to defend ourselves than, than just saying, God, you take care of them. Following the biblical example that David gave, you know, you can talk to me all you want, but I will pray for you. The psalmist here, he doesn't have a protective barrier against liars. There, there's really no, nothing that we can do, you know, they, to keep us, you know, from liars. But he called out to God, who, who, who knows all men's hearts, 
you know, who, who God knows all about them. And he cried out to God because he has the power over the consciences of bad men. And whenever God wants to, he can shut their mouths. And he can do that in many ways. But the psalmist's prayer in verse 1 was, Deliver my soul, O Lord, from lying lips. And his prayer is that so that he won't be ruined by the lies that the enemies are telling about him. He also prayed that he wouldn't lie in Psalm 119, uh, verse 29. Because he hated lying in verse 163. So that others wouldn't get a false impression of him and suffer from the consequences of lying. Because you see, the consequences of lying is that people will not believe what you, what the things that you said before the lie, because they're going to say, hey, well, I wonder if that was true. And then they're not going to believe you after you lie because they're not going to be able to trust anything that you say. Or it will really be hard for them to trust anything you say after you lie. But God heard his prayer and God answered his prayer. Even though the psalmist's enemies worked as hard as they could and did as much damage damage as they could to destroy him. But God didn't let them. Because the God of truth will protect his people from liars. Psalm 37, 6 says, He shall bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Compared to evil people and their wicked plans that end in failure, God is faithful, God is merciful, God is righteous, He's just, and His judgments, that is the things that He decides to do, they're all filled with wisdom. We don't have to be afraid of evil people. Because you see, we know that God loves us and that God judges evil and he will take care of us all through eternity. Now, what happens to a false tongue? Hey, we're told in verses three and four. As God will protect his people from this malicious world, he'll also take care of their enemies. In Psalm 12, verse three, it says, may the Lord cut off all flattering lips and the tongue that speaks proud things. And then in verse seven, of Psalm 12, he says, You shall keep them, O Lord. You shall preserve them from this generation forever. So he speaks, speaks about the flatterers and the liars in, in Psalm 12, 3. And then in verse 7, he speaks about his people. We might be tempted to believe those lies. <clears throat> and, and a lot of times we, we may believe that, that they're harmless. Even ye, but, and sometimes we'll even believe that lies are harmless and useful sometimes if the situation is right. But a lie is a lie and God doesn't overlook lies, nor does he overlook flattery, deception or boasting. Every one of these sins start from a wrong attitude and, and sooner or later they come out in our words And our tongue can be our worst enemy because, man, it can do a lot of damage and many times irreversible, leaving scars and hurt. We see that in James chapter 3, verse 5. James chapter 3, he writes a whole chapter on how evil the tongue is and how it's set on fire of hell. And it's like a poison snake and it cuts and it hurts and it does so much damage. That's why you have to be careful how you use your tongue, the things that you say. We have to think first before we speak and not think with emotions and, 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 you know, let that get the best of us. Because as soon as it goes out, it, it does the damage and we can't bring it back. Sincerity and truth are very valuable qualities, characteristics in a person because They're so rare today. A lot of people, a lot of people are nothing more than deceivers, liars and flatterers. And they think they'll get ahead by lying or flattering or deceiving people, or they'll get what they want by using those tactics of lying, deceiving and flattering. When we feel like honesty and truth, you know, and you look around and, 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 you know, you can feel it, you know, People aren't honest anymore. They're, they're, there's such, such little integrity in people today. Now, when you begin to feel like it's all gone, like honesty and truth is, is just all but disappeared, guess what? We have one awesome hope, and that is the Word of God. 
Because God's word is perfect. God's words are perfect and they're true. That's why we need to listen carefully when God speaks. So the warning here from the psalmist is directed to the sinner to wake up. To consider, verse 3 says, what shall be given to you or what shall be done to you for, for, for lying? What the righteous judge of heaven and earth will do to you. Because if sinners really knew and would stop and think for a moment about what will happen to them in the end, they wouldn't dare do the things that they do. You know, let liars think about what they're going to get when, when, when life is over for them. It says here, the psalmist says, you will be pierced by sharp arrows and burned with glowing coals. In other words, they will fall and they will be under God's wrath forever, for all eternity. And they will be made miserable by God's displeasure. This is a warning to all liars. Listen to what Psalm 64, 7, the warning to all liars. But God shall shoot at them with an arrow. Suddenly they shall be wounded. Even though they try to keep God at a distance, you can't be far enough, far away, or not, far enough away from God's arrows. God's arrows can reach them wherever they are, and they're sharp arrows as well. And they will pierce through the strongest barrier they will that, that you can put up, and they will penetrate the hardest of hearts. Job says the terrors of the Lord are his arrows, Job 6, 4. And his wrath is to be compared with burning coals. You see, this is the reward of the liar. This is the reward of the false tongue, the deceiver. It's the reward for all of those who love to lie. And they will have their share in the lake of fire that burns eternally. Listen to Revelation twenty two fifteen. But outside are dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. Look at that. I mean, he lumps, people don't think lying is a big deal. But he lumps liars in there with sorcerers and sexually immoral people and murderers and idolaters. In Revelation 21, 8, but the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, notice, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. It, it shows us how much God hates lies. And, and lies are what keeps people from coming to know the Lord Jesus Christ whom God gave his son for, to die for our sins. And that's why Satan is the father of lies, because he he tells lies to to, to mankind to such a degree and and mixed with half-truths that, you know what, They they feel they don't need God. They don't need Christ. They don't need their sins forgiven. They don't need salvation. That's why God hates liars. Verses five through seven. And the psalmist says, Woe is me that I dwell in Meshech, that I dwell among the tents of Kedar. My soul has dwelt too long with one who hates peace. I am for peace, but when I speak, they are for war. He says, How I suffer among all of these crooks of Meshech. He says, It it just really grieves me. It causes me pain to live with these people from Kedar. And he says, I'm tired of living with these people, with people who hate peace. Now for me, he says, I'm a man, I want peace. I'm for peace. But when I speak, they want war. And many people today think of themselves as peaceful and peace loving. But, but we're not. Now we might not be as aggressive or as militant as as those that don't know christ are but you know we are we're still not as peaceful and peace loving as we think we are none of us really are we're fighters and we prove it in our strong competition and in fights with other people and in our anger and in our grief when others you know, maybe are more successful than we are or, or they're liked by other people more than we are. 
Now, Meshech was a nation far to the north of Israel. Kedar was a nation that was to the southeast. But they were both known for being aggressive and cruel people. They were uncivilized people. And that's what, what the psalmist felt like he was living among. Those in, in, in Meshech and Kedar, I feel like I'm living among uncivil people. They're, they're aggressive and they're cruel. And the psalmist was sad that he, that he felt so far away from home. And he, he was so sad that he, that he was surrounded by such heathen people. And he's complaining about the bad neighborhood that he was driven into. What will a man get by living among such cruel, deceitful men? Nothing but spears and arrows, he said. All the injuries received because of lying and a spiteful tongue. And the psalmist says, woe is me. He says, I am forced to live among these kinds of people. He says, it's like living in Meshach and Kedar. It's like living with uncivilized people. They're cruel and they're aggressive. Not that he actually lived in Meshach or Kedar, but he lived among people that were rude and cruel, like those who lived in Meshach and Kedar. We would say it like this today. I live in a bad neighborhood. And it made him cry out, woe is me. Because he was forced to live far away from the laws of God. And while he was in exile, he looked at himself as a pilgrim. I'm not at home here. I'm never at home. But when he was away from God's altars, he cries out, woe is me. Because my stay here is so long that I can't get home to my resting place. I'm kept at a distance. A good man or a good woman cannot think of themselves being at home. We can't think of ourselves being at home when we're away from God's laws and when they're not within, within our reach. And all who love God, we, you know, we are grieved to be without the, uh, the means of grace and communion with God. And you can't help but cry out, woe is me. The psalmist was forced to live among wicked people. And who were at many times, man, they were just a big problem to him. They were a pain in the neck to him. And you know what? It's a a big problem to a good man. To be in and to be kept in the company of those that he hopes to be, that he doesn't want to be around, that he hopes to be separated from forever. To live a long time with these kinds of people, it's miserable because they're like thorns in his flesh. Notice, the character of a very good man in the psalmist is one who can honestly say, though he was a man of war, I am for peace. Living peaceably with all men. I don't want to, to be not at peace with anybody. He says, I love peace. I pursue peace. I want peace. And I have a peaceful disposition. And, I, and my joy is in peace. He says, I pray for peace. I strive for peace. And I will do anything and submit to anything and give anything for peace. I'm for peace. I've made it clear that I am. He says the wisdom that's from above, or I'm sorry, James says the wisdom that's from above is first pure and then peaceable. Secondly, the character of the worst of the men in the psalmist's enemies are those who pick quarrels with those that most wanted to have peace. He said, when I speak for peace, they are for war. And the more they want more, the more they find, I want peace. And he spoke with all the respect and kindness that he could. He offered ways to accommodate them. He spoke with reason. He spoke in love. But they just wouldn't listen to him. They just, you know, and there are some people who just want to fight. They just want to argue no matter what you say, no matter how you say it. These people were fierce, they were cold-hearted, and they were bent on causing trouble, plain and simple. These were Christ's enemies. Because for his love, they were his adversaries. And for his good works, and, and, and good works, 
they killed him. If we can, if we come in contact with these kinds of enemies, don't think it's strange. And don't, don't, and especially living in the times that we are in the world we are. You know, Jesus said, you know, if they hated you, if they hated me, they're going to hate you. You know, if I was their enemy, you're going to be their enemy. So, so if we come in contact with these kinds of, of enemies, don't think it's a strange thing. And, and, but, and also, don't let it make you try any less to make peace, to be a peacemaker. And, and don't let it come to the place where you think hey, it's no use. Why should I try to be a peacemaker? Why should I try to, to be at peace with people and, 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 you know, and, and think it's no use? Paul said this in Ephesians 4, 1 through 3. He said, bearing with one another in love. Notice, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. The word endeavoring means to spare no effort in keeping peace and unity. He says, spare no effort. He says, whatever it takes to be at peace, to make peace, do it. If a person wants to quarrel with me, I don't quarrel back. Endeavor, spare no effort to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Don't let, don't let argumentative people, you know, uh, aggressive people, angry people, don't let them, uh, don't be overcome by their evil or evil of any kind. Even, man, even if you're tested to the max, still try to overcome evil with good. Peter said, Peter said, Peter said this speaking to you and me in 1 Peter 2, 11 through 12. He's speaking to you and me. He says, Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. Notice, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, notice, they may by your good works, that is not speaking evil back, not arguing, not fighting with them, by your good works, which they observe. Notice, they see those good works. May they glorify God in the day of visitation. That is when Jesus comes to judge the world. As believers, we are sojourners here we're pilgrims in this world we're just passing through this is not our home because our real home is with god in the heavens made by god not by hands heaven is where god lives life in heaven operates according to god's ways god's principles his values and god, and heaven is eternal and it's unshakable our loyalty should be to our citizenship in heaven. That's our home, not our citizenship here. Because again, the Bible tells us the earth is going to be destroyed and there's going to be a new earth and a new heaven. And our loyalty should be to God's word, God's truth. Our loyalty should be to God's way of life and, to, and, and, dedi and, and his dedicated people. And because we're loyal to God, we will often feel like strangers in a world that would prefer to ignore God. In closing, Paul said in Colossians 3, 1, 3, If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Now, seeking those things that are above, that means striving, doing all you can to put heaven's priorities into practice every day. He said, setting your mind on things above. This means concentrating on the eternal, on the heavenly, rather than the earthly, which is the temporal, the temporal which is passing by. The world is just passing by. It's gonna, or should say passing away. And the reason is, he says, because you died with Christ. That means that we should have very little desire for this world like a dead person would. We've died in Christ. 
the old man has, has passed away and everything has become new. The Christian's real home is where Jesus lives. Jesus said in John 14, 2 through 3, My father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So, knowing this, it should, it should give us a, a different view of our lives, a, a different perception of our lives here on earth. When Paul said, and then he said, to set your mind on things above, this means to look at life from God's perspective and to seek the things that God desires. Our heart should be one, be like one with God. Again, hating the things that God hates and loving the things that God loves. And, and you know what? When it does, when, when, when we have the perspective that God has, when we see things through the eyes of God and we desire the things that desire, that God desires, that will be a cure for the things of this world. That will be a cure for materialism. We get the right view of material goods and stuff and possessions and th- when we see them the way God sees them. The more we think of the world around us the way God does, that if we're in love with this world, we're at, we're at enmity with God. That, that the world does not help us, it doesn't do us any good. The more we think of the world around us the way God does, the more we're going to live in harmony with God. The closer we'll be to God. So we can't and must not get too attached to what's only temporary. Again, this world is not our home. We can't settle down here. We can't be at home here. And I heard someone say one time that, that, that settling down here in this world is like an eagle living in a barnyard with chickens. Because an eagle was the king of all birds and he was meant to soar to the highest heights. And so are God's people. We are meant to soar in the highest of heights. And yet we settle down here like a, like a, which would be so out of place, like an eagle living in a chicken coop with a bunch of chickens. We're not to get attached here. We're not to settle down here. It's not to be our home. It, it, we're not to be at home like the psalmist said in Meshech or, or Kadar. So if you are, stop conforming to this world's lies. And the ways of life in this world. You need to get up and you need to start walking away. And you need to say goodbye to this world and to your sins. And to start marching towards heaven. Where the King of glory, Jesus Christ, is waiting for you. Father, again, we thank you for this wonderful psalm, Lord. And Father... Father, as we looked at the return of Christ this morning, Father, Paul said we are to be looking, looking for that glorious appearing of Jesus Christ. Looking for. That means looking up. And God, we're to be doing the same here, Lord. We're to be looking for you, Lord. We're to be walking away from this world. To be, we're to be marching towards heaven, which is our home, Lord. Where the King of glory and the King of kings is, is waiting for us. Father, we pray that your word would be a lamp unto our feet and a light to our path, God. We pray that it would give us wisdom and discernment, that it would convict us, God, that it would judge us of all things, and especially those things, God, that are not of you, those things that grieve you and displease you, God. That we would be men and women, God, who serve you with a whole heart and a whole mind. And who love you with soul, mind, and heart, God. Totally and completely. So, Father, we thank you, we love you, and we give you honor and praise. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.